Uh, looking forward to hearing about your talk. Um, and Lucas, one of your recording. So feel free to get started. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I guess I want to preface this talk by saying that uh, this is going to be posted on YouTube. And whether you're listening live or watching it on YouTube, um, I'm going to mention a whole bunch of different um, technologies and uh, various things. And I will post links to all of those in the description for the video and or on my website. Um, so for example, I'll also like um, throw a bunch of, well, maybe not a bunch, but a little bit of code at you. And you can find that on my website um, as well so that you can play around with this thing that I'm about to make. Okay, so um, let me share my screen. So this thing that I've just mentioned is my Hawaiian earring. Um, and so uh, as always, I have to do my little diagnostic thing again. Um, so this is for uh, math talk for SUMS, uh, which is the undergraduate math society at the University of Rochester. Okay. And so uh, I am Charlotte Ayton and I'm here to talk about my Hawaiian earring. Oh, and let me drag my annotation menu over. Okay. So in the summer of 2018, at the end of my first year of graduate school, I was invited to a conference on universal algebra and lattice theory in Hawaii. The conference was called Algebras and Lattices in Hawaii. And I was to give a talk on a multiplayer version of rock, paper, scissors. Um, you can find various versions of this talk, although not the one I actually gave in Hawaii. Um, on uh, YouTube as well. So I'm not going to be talking about rock, paper, scissors today though. I'm going to be talking about how I designed an earring for the conference, which depicts an object in lattice theory called the free distributive lattice on three generators. So the previous summer to the summer in the story, so this would be uh, 2017, I had bought a do-it-yourself 3D printer kit based on the RepRap Prusa i3. And so this is one of the things that I will, I will link you to. I had a friend who had recently taken a class on microcontrollers at Monroe Community College, and uh, we built the printer together. As long as I could produce an appropriate 3D object file, I could use the printer to make my earring. Oh, and also, I haven't really gotten to anything too technical yet, but um, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as well if you would like to. Okay, so here's a picture of the printer in 2021. 20, uh, it, it has survived the last few years, although it's a little worse for the wear. Um, and you can also see for reference, this is, this is, a, uh, this is a, a $1 million uh, bill here. <laughs> I have uh, that uh, blanket here, which is a million dollar bill. So you can compare that for size. Um, and here's the laptop controlling the printer and so forth. All right. So in this talk, I'll first talk about um, some general definitions of what posets and lattices are, which are special kinds of posets. Then I'll talk about distributive lattices, which are special kinds of lattices. And then I'll talk about free distributive lattices, which are even more special kinds of distributive lattices. Um, and so then the earring um, that I want to make is uh, represents the free distributive lattice on three generators, which is a particular one of these. And then I'll discuss uh, drawing the earring, which will involve uh, doing some math in order to, to draw it correctly and also a little bit of coding to actually tell the computer how to draw this thing. And then finally, I'll discuss the printing of the earring. Okay. So uh, first of all, um, a poset, which is the general class of things to which all of the objects I'm going to uh, discuss for the next several minutes uh, fall into, um, posets essentially capture the idea of a collection of things with some kind of ordering on them, um, which is allowed to be uh, sort of a, a weak notion of ordering, similar to how the natural numbers are ordered, but a little bit more general. So formally, a poset is a set, P, of points or elements, uh, along with a partial order, which we denote by less than or equal to, to evoke the usual 
concept of less than or equal to for numbers. Um, and this partial order must be reflexive, which means that if I take any element in my post set, it's less than or equal to itself. It should also be anti-symmetric, which means that if X is less than or equal to Y and Y is less than or equal to X, then they're actually the same. This is a familiar property for numbers. And um, finally, we also need it to be transitive, which means that if X is less than or equal to Y and Y is less than or equal to Z, then X has to be, oh, yay, I found my first typo. Then X is less than or equal to Z. Okay, that's, that's transitivity. All right. So, um, and this last thing is also a familiar property of numbers. And indeed, uh, the natural numbers uh, with the usual ordering is a post set. And so that's our first example of a post set. And um, other familiar collections of numbers um, do this as well. So if I take um, the rational numbers, for instance, and their usual ordering, or the real numbers, and their usual ordering, those also work. So uh, in order to depict a post set, we can use what's called a Hasse diagram, which is a graph whose vertices correspond to the elements of the post set and whose edges indicate the ordering. And um, rather than formally define this, I'll show you by an example, and then that should make it pretty clear. So if we have some post set with a given set of elements and a given uh, partial order on them, um, say this particular one, uh, where our elements are A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those are just some names for elements that are all six different elements. And uh, we have this ordering where strictly less than means that A is less than or equal to D, for example, and A is not actually equal to D. We want them to be different. That's what the strictly less than means. Um, and so on for the other ones. Uh, then we actually have the following Hasse diagram. So for example, since A is uh, below D, we interpret that as uh, we put A down here, D, it doesn't have to be directly above, but more, uh, but further up in the vertical uh, direction, um, although it can be off to the side if we like in our Hasse diagram. And so then we put an edge between A and D to show that D is really above A. And then similarly, we want D to be below E. So then we put E say over here and draw an edge from D up to E. And then we do the same thing. B goes up to D, which is then below F, and C is also below D. Um, now, we didn't actually spell out all of the possible relations here because, for example, um, since this is a post set uh, and we know that C lies below D and also that D lies below E, we do also have that C is below E as well. Um, but this information is enough to specify the whole post set. And then this is a TASA diagram. Um, so notice that we don't draw an edge between every two uh, vertices in our Hasse diagram, which um, are related. So for example, C is less than or equal to E, but we're not really, okay, maybe that's not the best example. So I guess you could imagine that we did draw an edge from C to E because it would overlap the ones from C to D and D to E. But maybe a better example is that we know that A lies below D and D lies below E. So A must lie below E, but we didn't draw this edge here. And that's just because the Hasse diagram would get too busy or confusing to look at if it had so many edges. And so we just put in enough that we can figure out um, which things are below which other things. So for example, if I know A lies below D and D lies below E, then I can follow this path up and see that A lies below E as well. So now all of the data about this post set is contained in this Hasse diagram. And so um, unlike our previous examples of the natural numbers or the rational or the real numbers, um, these uh, there are only um, six elements here. So it's a finite collection of elements and their ordering isn't uh, linear. Um, the corresponding Hasse diagram for the natural numbers would have, um, for example, one and then two and then three and so forth. And we just sort of go on linearly like this forever. But that's quite different from this post set here. But this is still a post set. Okay. Now, uh, given some post set, 
we're going to denote by this a less than less than x, the statement that for all um, little x in our collection x, a lies below little x. And I'll give examples of this in a minute that will make it clearer, but I just want to um, get the definitions out. So um, in this case, we say that a is a lower bound for the set x. And we think of a as lying below all of the points in the set x. Um, we say that a lower bound is the greatest lower bound or infimum of x when if we take any element in our post set, if it's a lower bound for the set x, then it must actually lie below or be equal to a. And so we can similarly define upper bound and least upper bound or supremum. And the words infimum and supremum may be familiar to you if you've had a real analysis course, for example. And they are quite related to those concepts in real analysis because the real numbers are post set with their usual ordering. So in the post set P we depicted previously, which I've drawn again here, we actually have that A is a lower bound for the set containing E and F. And so if we look at E and F here, then we can see that A lies below E and also that A lies below F. And so since A is below everything in this set, A is a lower bound. And then we, we write it in this way. Now, similarly, we have that B lies below uh, the set containing E and F. B is below E, B is below F. And uh, we also have that D is a lower bound for the set EF. Well, now if we look at all of those lower bounds, what are our lower bounds? Maybe I'll put squares around them. So A, B, C, and D are all lower bounds for the set containing E and F. And notice that D is actually the biggest of these lower bounds. If I take any other lower bound, it is going to lie below D. And so D is the greatest lower bound or the infimum of the set E and F. And we can denote that this way. All right. Um, now, similarly, we can do a similar thing with upper bounds and looking at the set uh, AB instead of the set EF. And we find that the upper bounds for the set AB would be these three, but not, not C. And the uh, least upper bound would be D. And so D is also the supremum or least upper bound of the set AB. Now, uh, a, a set of elements in a post set doesn't necessarily have to have um, a greatest lower bound or a least upper bound, or it can actually have more than one too. So to see an example where a pair of elements doesn't have a, a least upper bound, we can look at EF. So there is no element that lies above both E and F because, um, well, there are no elements that are, that are bigger than, than E and also bigger than F. The only thing that's at least as big as E is E itself and similarly for F. And so since E and F have no common upper bound, um, the supremum, which would be the least of those, doesn't uh, exist in this post set. So this is, this is just not defined in this case. So now a lattice is a special kind of post set in which every pair of elements does have a supremum and an infimum. And so uh, that's really nice. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's, um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was a little, I was a little mistaken before. So, so, um, right. Okay, yeah, I was, I was, I was being ridiculous. Yeah, so I made one, I made one mistake, which I was, which I was silly to say. I didn't actually draw a picture of it because it, it can't happen. But, um, but uh, you can, you, if you have a supremum or an infimum, it has to be unique. So, for example, if these things did have two upper bounds like this, all right. So, if these guys did have two upper bounds like this, and we're still looking at this set E and F. Um, these two new elements, say U and V, are both upper bounds for the set E and F, but neither one can be a, a least upper a least upper bound because a least upper bound has to be less than or equal to all the other upper bounds. 
And so if U and B can't be compared, they're both at the top. Then, then neither one of these would be the supermum. So I was, I was being ridiculous there. If there's a supermum or an infimum, it must be unique. Okay. So a lattice then is a post set in which every pair of elements has a necessarily unique uh, least upper bound and greatest lower bound. So, uh, for example. If the natural, if we take the natural numbers with the usual ordering as our lattice, then um, the uh, the infimum of two elements is just the, the smaller one, the minimum of those two, and the supermum of two elements is just the maximum or the bigger of those two. So. Uh, the post set P that we depicted previously is not a lattice since the supermum um, does not exist. And so uh, the post set that I've pictured below here is actually a lattice. So um, for example, if we take these two elements, they do have a least upper bound in the lattice, which would be this one. They also have a greatest lower bound, which would be this one. And you can check for any other pair of elements. There also exists a, um, an infimum and a supremum, which is the unique greatest lower bound or least upper bound of that pair of elements. Now, I'm going to give you a different definition of a lattice. And um, so foreshadowing, this, this will somehow be equivalent to what I've already said. But um, OK, so the second definition says that a lattice, uh, which I'll now denote with an L, uh, has a set of elements, L, and comes equipped with two binary operations. And so you can think of, uh, think of uh, me like uh, similar to multiplication, multiplication, and this is going to be called join, and this is similar to addition. So you can think of it as being like a set of numbers with a multiplication and an, and an addition defined on it, with the properties that um, x meet x, that's how this is read, is x meet x is actually just x again. x join x has to be x again as well. So that's already different from the usual properties that addition and multiplication of like natural or real numbers have, um, but that's what we require. This is what we require for a lattice. So these are just like multiplication and addition. They're not certainly not the same. Um, we do need that they're commutative. So this is similar to how x plus y is equal to y plus x and so forth. And uh, we need them to be associative. This is also something similar to how addition and multiplication work. Um, for example, this just looks quite similar to saying that x times y times z is the same thing as if I multiply x by the product of y and z, where I multiplied y and z together first. OK. And then the last law relates these two things together, um, and that one's called absorption. I need that x meet x join y is x, and x join x meet y is also x. Oh, and this these, uh, these squiggly equal signs are just supposed to be regular equal signs. That's just a typo. OK, that's typo two, I think, if you're keeping track. Um, all right, so a lattice then can also be defined as some set of elements with two operations, which are kind of like an addition and multiplication, but they're, they're pretty weird. Um, they have to satisfy these properties. OK, so um, we can actually make a lattice in this uh, sense, which I'll call the algebraic version of a lattice, um, from the post set version of a lattice by defining x meet y to be the infimum of the pair x and y. So this is x meet y is then um, the greatest lower bound of this, the pair x and y. And similarly, x join y can be defined to be the least upper bound of the set x and y. And so, um, OK, so then I claim that if you define these two operations this way by using the infimum and supremum, which must exist because we're assuming that our post set is a lattice, and that's what it means for a post set to be a lattice. Um, then you'll have that all of these properties, all of these different properties, idempotence, commutativity, associativity, and absorption, they all hold when you 
um, take this meat operation to be the infimum and this join to be the supermum. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that to you to verify, but you can just believe me for now. Okay, so then we can actually go backwards too and turn a lattice um, and turn a, a lattice, the algebra version back into a poset by which is still a lattice as a poset by defining x to be less than or equal to y in our poset p when x is the meat of x and y. So that actually will give us a poset in the sense that I defined before, which is actually a lattice as I first defined it. So these two concepts are equivalent to each other. It doesn't seem maybe totally obvious at first, but these, these are the same thing in different um, presentations. And so we can thus think of lattices either as posets or as algebras. And by an algebra, I just mean something like this, which is a set with some ways of multiplying or adding or combining elements together somehow. Okay, so in the case of the natural numbers with their, with their usual ordering, the corresponding algebra, which is a lattice as an algebra, is the natural numbers where the meat is the minimum and the soup or in the join is the maximum of those two uh, natural numbers. So then I could, for example, write um, two meat three would be two um, because two would be the greatest lower bound of each of these, which is also the minimum of two and three. Okay. So distributive lattices are special kinds of lattices. And the reason why I needed the algebraic formulation of a lattice was because I need to use that to define um, what these guys are. This is the easiest way to, to do this, I think. So we say that a lattice is distributive when for any elements x, y, and z, x meet y join z is actually x meet y join x meet z. And so if you think of meet like multiplication and join like addition, this is just like the identity that says that, that multiplication must distribute over, over addition. So, uh, okay, so this, this is exactly saying that meet distributes, distributes over join. All right, so now the lattice of natural numbers with its usual ordering is distributive. It turns out that a lattice is distributive exactly when for all possible elements in the lattice, uh, we have that join distributes over meet. And so this is something that definitely doesn't happen for um, usual number systems like the real numbers, for example, because this is saying that multiplication distributes over addition exactly when addition distributes over multiplication, if you're thinking of it that way. And certainly it's not, it's not true that X plus Y times Z should be equal to uh, x um, plus y times x plus z in general. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is something that doesn't happen for usual number systems, um, but it does happen for lattices. If you have this distributivity, then you have the other one. Okay, so this lattice is distributive. This lattice I pictured before is actually distributive. Now, there are not non-distributive lattices. There are lattices that are not distributive, where the analog of multiplication doesn't distribute over the analog of addition. So in other words, meet does not distribute over join or vice versa. And so there are two examples of this where um, a lattice isn't distributive, where the lattice has five elements. And so uh, one of them is called M3, and the other one is called N5, and they're pictured here. Okay, so that's just to let you see that there are non-distributive ones and that's what they look like or what some of them look like. Okay, so now I'm not going to um, define them, but there are special distributive lattices, which are called free distributive lattices. Um, they're in a certain sense, the most general possible distributive lattices. For each set, there's a free distributive lattice that's generated by that set. I wanted to make an earring. So now we're finally back to the thing I talked about at the beginning. I wanted to make an earring um, for this conference on universal algebra and lattice theory that looked like the Hasse diagram for the free distributive lattice on a set of three generators, say X, Y, and Z. And I'm gonna call this lattice FD3. So here's a Hasse diagram for um, this free distributive lattice on three generators. 
Um, it's it's a little more complicated than the the one that I or the ones that we've been looking at so far. Um, maybe a little more attractive to look at. And so um, you can see that we have these generators x, y, and z, and the other elements of this lattice correspond to different various ways that we can take meets and joins of these elements and also have it be distributed. And so this is sort of the most general way that this can be done. Sorry. So um, for example, we can actually see in the picture here, um, this particular element is below both X and Y, and actually anything else that lies below X and Y has to be below this. So this is X meet Y, or the greatest lower bound of X and Y. And then um, we can see that uh, that this element here will be uh, x meet z. And so this is x meet y join x meet z because it's the least upper bound of those and, and so forth. And if you do that, you'll see that you can make exactly, well, 18 things, 18 things. And then the other two, um, technically I wouldn't include them. I would say that these other two things come from assuming that you have a bounded lattice, but let's not worry about that right now. We're just gonna stick them on because this is the top thing that I want to make a little hole in so that I can put the hook on to hook this earring into my ear. So that's fine. We'll take the bounded one. Okay. And so I also want you to notice that essentially what this thing looks like is that there's one cube here and another cube here, which share this vertex in common in the middle. And then there's some other stuff hanging off of them. And this would be even more symmetric if I could show it in three dimensions and draw these as nice um, regular cubes. All right, so I use the SAGE computer algebra system to draw my earring. SAGE can do calculations with post sets and can draw Hasse diagrams. So um, for example, if I wanna make a post set in SAGE, uh, this is essentially Python by the way, SAGE is, is um, a bunch of Python scripts that combine some um, older computer algebra systems and like Magma and um, some newer code to make a, a nice computer algebra system. And so, um, so if I want to create this post set, I can just hard code this thing in, which is what I did. Um, and I can um, say that P is, is some post set object where these are the elements of my post set, which is just going to be the set zero, one, up through 19, that's what range 20 is. Um, and then I can specify all of these different um, relations, just like I did when I defined that five element post set before. So for example, this says that vertex 16 should be less than, or strictly less than actually, vertex 18, 18 should be below 19 and so forth. And then I can actually have uh, Sage show me what that looks like. So Sage's Hasse diagram for this free distributive lattice on three generators looks good, but it's only 2D. And I need a 3D thing for my earring. So I needed two copies of this unit cube in three dimensions. I've pictured, uh, or I've labeled some of its vertices. I mean, this cube um, where you can figure out the other two vertices from the, the six that I've given. And so, uh, I could accomplish this by rotating this cube so that the origin stays fixed, but I want to take this, uh, this far opposite corner of the cube and rotate it so that it goes onto the positive Z axis. I feel like that would be a nice symmetric way to depict this cube. And so um, this basically amounts to rotating the rectangle whose vertices I've, I've left labeled here. So the rectangle with these vertices that cuts the, the cube in, in two, I wanna rotate that about the origin in the plane that it spans. So we can imagine that there's this rectangle that sits between these four. And I wanna take this and I wanna rotate it up until this vertex actually goes onto the Z axis here. That is my goal. So first, let's look at an analogous rotation of a square in the xy plane. So if I have my unit square, then I'd like to rotate it so that this vertex gets taken to somewhere on the uh, y axis. 
in order to obtain something like what's pictured on the right. The size of the squares doesn't look exactly the same because the software that renders these things just sort of automatically sizes them, but these are meant to be the same size square. So if we do some trigonometry, uh, we can see that this is a, uh, that what we need to do is take a rotation counterclockwise by an angle of pi over four radians. Um, you might kind of be able to guess this just by looking at the picture, um, but you could also actually compute it by seeing that if we want to um, move this over to here, then the angle that we want is actually, we wanna rotate by this angle, but that's the same as this angle. And then um, doing some trig with the side lengths, we can find that that angle should be pi over four. So uh, we can accomplish this by using a rotation matrix. A general rotation by angle theta can be represented by using this matrix R theta, um, whose entries are cos theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. And so when theta is pi over four, our pi over four rotation matrix is one over root two, negative one over root two, one over root two, one over root two, or in other words, uh, this. So now if I multiply all of these uh, points that I have in my square by this rotation matrix, I get this collection of four points. And then when I plot them, I can clearly see that this does give me, um, this does give me the desired figure. And, um, and notice that you can um, compute that the lengths of these sides are unchanged. I really have just rotated this, this uh, square with side length one around the um, origin here. All right, so now I'd like to do the same sort of um, thing in three dimensions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to look at the plant, the, the plane that is um, spanned by this rectangle. So this is the same rectangle from the middle of the cube that I was talking about before. I'm gonna give names to um, the two unit um, vectors in um, this plane. And so one of them will be U, that's a length one um, vector in this direction of one, one, zero. And then V is gonna be the length one vector in um, the direction of the Z axis. And so now I can actually consider this rectangle as just sitting inside of the UV plane. Okay, so then this, this is U and this is, this is V. And so this vertex of the rectangle is actually bigger than, than U. It's the square root of two times U. All right, so now I can do some more trigonometry similar to what we did before. I can go back to my rectangle I can say I need to finish rotating by this angle in order to move this onto the uh, V axis, which happens to also be the Z axis. And so that's actually the same as this angle. And so then I can compute these uh, side lengths here. This one square root of two, this is one square root of three. And then I can do some more trigonometry and I can figure out uh, what that angle should be. Or rather what its sine and cosine should be, because that's enough for me to compute its rotation matrix. So now when I do that, I find that the cosine of this angle is one over square root of three, and the sine of this particular angle is root two over root three. So I get this for a rotation matrix by whatever that angle is. Then I can multiply the points in my rectangle by this rotation matrix in order to get the following rotated rectangle. And I apologize for it being small. It's because these things are so big and that's just how it rendered. Okay, and so we can either think of these points as being in the UV plane, which is what I've depicted here, or we can think of them as being actually points in three-dimensional space by converting back. Because U and V were actually represented as points in 3D space originally. Okay, so that rotates the rectangle and then a similar analysis for the other vertices of the cube gives the following um, vertices for a rotated cube. So I'm going to now in Python um, denote by A, B, and C these three quantities. And then um, the vertices of the cube can be expressed in this way. So then this is just making a list in Python of the vertices of the cube. So uh, by symmetry, the other cube 
the one, remember, I, I, if I go way back here, what was I trying to do? I was trying to draw this thing. And so what I just did was drew this cube where this, um, this cube is lying entirely above the XY plane. And this is the origin of 3D space. So then the other cube is exactly the same thing with its Z coordinates all negated. And that's part of the reason I wanted to rotate my original cube up there because it would make it um, prettier to <laughs> reflect it across the XY plane. So then the other cube, which I'm calling cube one here, the original was cube zero, is the same thing where all of the uh, Z coordinates have been negated. So C becomes minus C and so forth. Now I have to hard code in, oh, I don't have to, but I chose to hard code in all the edges of the Hasse diagram for the free distributive lattice on three generators. And so um, here are the edges in the first cube. Here are the edges in the second cube. And then um, here are, uh, Okay, and then here are some of the edges that go between the two cubes. And then there are also some edges that stick out of the top and bottom, um, which I add in along with these to get the total collection of edges of the cube or of the, the Hasse diagram for the free distributed lattice on three generators. All right, so now um, I need to, assuming I'm working in a command line or an IDE, which I, I was actually just doing this as a quick scratch work thing in the command line. Uh, we need to import from Sage um, its line segment and sphere objects or constructors rather. I guess everything's an object. <laughs> okay. And so, and then finally we can assemble the earring. And so um, what we do is we start off with Al just being uh, the none object in Python. And uh, then we start adding things to it. So for each edge, we make a line segment of radius 0.1 uh, between the appropriate vertices. And then um, for each vertex in our um, cube, well, I have uh, the vertices, or for each vertex in the Hasse diagram, excuse me, I have the vertices from my original cube. This is the top one. All of the vertices except for the zeroth one in the second cube, the reason being that that vertex is already in the first cube. It was the origin. And then I have to add in um, some other vertices for the, the ones that don't appear in either cube. And then for all of those vertices, I'm going to add into my collection of objects L uh, a sphere of radius 0.1 at the appropriate location. And then finally, I can ask Sage to show uh, what that three-dimensional object looks like. So now I will show you what that looks like. Um, I'm actually going to use Blender as opposed to the output that Sage had, but uh, it will be similar. So I'm going to stop showing my screen for a second and then share. Uh, okay. All right. Can, can someone confirm for me that they can see this Blender screen now? Yep. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, okay. So now this, this is the object that I just um, described. And so um, Sage actually uh, wants to display this in JMOL initially, which um, is another 3D graphics visualization tool. Um, but you can save the output as an STL file, and then I just imported that into Blender. And so um, as you can see, we have the two cubes. We have these extra, um, we have these extra vertices that stick out in the middle, and then we have those top and bottom elements. And so, um, so this is it. This is the earring that I wanted. And it's so much more regular in three dimensions, uh, which is quite pleasing. All right. So now I uh, am going to get back to my slides here. So, okay. So I, I'm at the point where I have I have an STL 3D image file, and I'm ready to try to print this earring. Sadly, 3D printing isn't totally trivial. Just because I could do all of the other steps and I had a 3D printer from which I had been able to print other things does not mean that I was able to print this in a reasonable amount of time, at least. Um, this earring is too difficult for me. 
or at least it was back in 20, 2018. So it's too fine. I need to make it solid, which is not hard to do in Sage, but I, I didn't do it here. And um, I need to make it bigger so with more printing supports, which are essentially little extra spokes that take, you know, say this is my object. The printing supports will be little little um, spokes that literally support the object as it's being printed. And then they can be cut off later when you're ready to actually use it or do something else with it. So I could do that. I could make it solid. I could make it bigger. I could add more supports even manually if I wanted to. There's software that helps you. I could do it. But I need it to be small and light. The lightness isn't much of a concern with the bioplastic that the printer uses. But I need it to be small. <laughs> so that it can be an earring, because it'll be annoying if it's too big on my ear. Um, so what I could really use in my fantasy world here is a, a metal laser sintering machine, because then I could make this thing from silver or gold or some other precious metal, if, assuming the laser sinterer can do that metal, in the right size, um, and have it actually be able to support itself, because the metal is much more sturdy in the laser sintering process than, than the bioplastic is on my do-it-yourself home 3D printer. But these things are still expensive and they were even more expensive back in 2018. They easily cost over 10,000 US dollars. You can spend 20, 40, 50,000 uh, US dollars on a laser center. So um, I, I, more realistically, I could try the printers on campus too. I could try to get a better one myself, um, but uh, this was just sort of a, a cute little side project for me. And when I found that the printing part was intractable, I realized that I had actual math to get back to doing and I should stop messing around for now. So, um, so sadly, this talk does not end with me showing you the actual earring. I um, am not wearing it because it doesn't exist yet. Um, but uh, I had a lot of fun designing it and maybe someday somehow I or someone else will actually make it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this talk and that something productive did, uh, did come out of it. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank, thank did you. For attending. Um, did anybody have any questions? So have you tried to print it out since 20? since when you did this or? Um, so yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't really tried to print it again. Actually, <laughs> I haven't used the printer in a while. Um, I've moved since um, the last time I used it. So I pulled it out last night and I, I was impressed with myself that I could get it to print, although the quality was still quite low. The thing needs a lot of care and cleaning. It's really sensitive. Um, this is, the, it, it, Back in 2018, when these things still weren't, you know, super, you know, it's not like you can buy a really, really good 3D printer for $20, you know, this was like the cheapest type of thing that you could get, do it yourself, as cheap as possible. It works, but it needs a lot of babysitting. Like it's, yeah, so I was able to kind of print stuff last night a little bit. Um, and I, I was happy about that, but I haven't tried to do the earring again. And certainly on my printer, I think it's not going to be possible. It's it's just, it's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to finally make it someday, though. I think that would be cool. Oh, uh, OK, Lucas has a question. Uh, do I think a fancier 3D printer would be better? Oh, yeah, that's, so that's what I said in the last, um, mm -hmm. the last uh, thing in my slides there. I said. I, I had I haven't tried the 3D printers on campus yet, and so I should. Um, I don't know how fancy they are, um, but I I should certainly try at some point. Um, uh, maybe I will this summer, this fall. Uh, that would be cool. And um, if you or anyone else know more about 3D printing than I do, then I would I would appreciate any help that you can give me because I'm I'm still pretty new at it. <laughs>